My name is David Cohen, and I'm the president of Five Towns College. It is my privilege to join with those who welcome you to the League of Women Voters of Huntington online Meet the Candidates Forum, presented today by the students, faculty, and staff of Five Towns College. For nearly 50 years, Five Towns College has been participating in the cultural and social life of Long Island. Our community of artists and scholars in the town of Huntington focuses on music, media, and the performing arts. Our students have a huge impact on the social and cultural fabric of our region. And so today, as much as any time in the history of our democracy, it is critical to have an informed and engaged electorate. And so Five Towns College is honored to do its part to help bring this important event to you. You can learn more about each of the candidates, as well as the important work of the League of Women Voters of Huntington online. You can also learn more about Five Towns College at www.ftc.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Good evening, everyone. I am Diane Slavin. I'm the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Huntington. Welcome to our first virtual Meet the Candidate Night event. Thanks to the staff of Five Towns College for hosting us and providing the technical support that we needed actually at quite short notice. So we really appreciate that. They are recording this program and it will be posted on the League of Women Voters of Huntington's YouTube channel as soon as possible. Okay. Um, the League of Women Voters of Huntington is an active and vibrant nonpartisan voluntary organization. Our mission is to encourage and engage citizens into being active and educated participants in government. We never ever support a politician or a political party. Democracy is not a spectator sport, and we in the League of Women Voters of Huntington are definitely not spectators. We do voter registration drives, sponsor candidates nights such as this, engage students in programs at their school, help register new citizens at naturalization ceremonies, visit our elected officials, and more. Due to COVID-19, our in-person activities have been canceled or postponed, but we continue to meet by phone and video conference to plan outreach to our community about voter registration, education, and information on upcoming primaries and the general election. Okay, uh, our tonight, Lisa Scott is our moderator. She is president of the Suffolk County League of Women Voters. She is not a constituent in the Congressional District 3, um, so we try to uh, limit bias or conflict of interest through that. Our timer, Stephanie Quarles, is an appointed director to the League of Women Voters of Huntington. Um, the questions have been developed by the League of Women Voters of Huntington and supplemented by questions of other leagues and the general membership of the League of Women Voters of Huntington. In addition, a request for questions was posted on Facebook and Instagram. All questions have been vetted by the League of Women Voters. All questions will be addressed to all candidates. We will do our best to cover as many topic areas as time permits. We're very happy that we have all three of you candidates here tonight, Michael Weinstock, Tom Swazi, and Melanie D'Argo, Arrigo. All right, here's the, 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 the district on the map. And it's quite a large district uh, on Long Island. It contains part of Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk counties, with an estimated population of close to three quarters of a million people. Just a couple of notes um, before we begin on important dates. Of course, the uh, primary is June 23rd. Early voting begins this Saturday and continues through the 21st. June 16th is the last date of postmark absentee ballot applications. And June 22nd is the last date of postmark and absentee ballot. Lastly, we hope that everyone who views this becomes an educated, informed, educated voter. 
um, we would like to direct you to the league's uh, voter online voter guide, uh, vote411.org. You can find out who's on your ballot, find out more about the candidates, and check uh, that make sure that your voter registration uh, information is correct. Also, to stay up to date on all voting changes in New York uh, related to COVID-19, text VOTE NEW YORK to 474747. And with that, I will turn the program over to Lisa Scott. Thank you, Diane. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for uh, volunteering with the timing. And to the candidates, again, as you told Diane, I hope you're okay with first names. So Melanie, Tom, and Michael, right? Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to be keeping track, as Diane said. Uh, I usually make one or two mistakes in my cycling around about who goes first. Phil, that you can clarify, <laughs> interrupt me. Otherwise, no. <laughs> um, we do ask, as, as Diane and Stephanie will indicate, that you adhere to the timing. The other thing is I'm used to doing this in a large room uh, with lots of people who support candidates and I spend a lot of time telling people to stop clapping and interrupting and everything else. So on the one hand, this is pleasant, but on the other hand, it's a little bit of an echo chamber and the energy you get from a room full of people who want to learn more <laughs> is really an intrinsic part of the campaigning process and voter education. Uh, the Huntington League did put together uh, just under 20 questions on a variety of subjects. I do want to try to cover them as much as we can. Uh, again, the opening statements will be um, your choice, how you want to go with that, two minutes. Uh, we always encourage people to be positive, to talk about why people should vote for them. Uh, obviously, personal attacks on opponents are uh, not permitted. I will inter uh, interrupt on that. Otherwise, it's important you be as succinct and as detailed as possible. Uh, uh, again, you'll have 90 seconds for an answer to a question. If you do want to uh, rebut, you can have five is what we had agreed ahead of time. I'll play that a little bit by ear. I would recommend that do not raise your hand because we all inadvertently move our hands and I can't tell. I have to look through the gallery all the time. So I'd ask you to do something uh, that'll, that's a little disconcerting so I can see you right away and know that you'd like to speak. Uh, before you all got on, I said it's like a fishing lure. You need to attract my attention for me to call on you. So without further ado, um, Melanie, you'll go first for your two-minute opening statement, then Tom, then Michael, and then we'll start the rotation with questions. Thank you. Should I begin? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Hi, uh, before I begin, I just want to thank the Huntington League of Women Voters for organizing tonight's candidate forum and for all that you do to promote civic engagement. I also want to thank Five Towns for recording this event this evening. My name is Melanie Dorigo and I am running in the Democratic primary in New York's third district. I'm a mom, I'm an organizer, and I'm an allied health professional. I'm a native Long Islander who spent my career working with patients and families and later organizations building health improvement and risk mitigation programs. My work has centered on helping people live healthier lives, and now I'm ready to take that skill set to Congress. I decided to run for the seat because I didn't feel represented, and I don't think our district is being represented. The more I got involved in my community and the political process, I realized the only way we were going to change the laws is if we elect representatives who want to change them. You see, I believe in a democracy built of, by, and for the people. So when I saw bill after bill favoring corporations and not people, from healthcare initiatives that prioritize the profits of the pharma and insurance industry to immigration legislation that allowed children to be locked in cages while corporations made huge profits off of the detention centers, I knew I had to step up and run for my community. What you will see here this evening are different approaches to policies. But what I want to impress upon you is that a candidate's agenda is a value system. And I hope that you will all vote your values, uh, as you always should. I look forward to sharing my people-centered agenda with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Tom? Thanks so much. Uh, I also want to thank the League of Women Voters in five towns. You know, the Merchant Marine Academy is located in our district, and their motto is, acta non verba. 
acts, not words. It doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. Well, I have a record of accomplishment, fighting for my district and for the people of New York, and I'm running for re-election on that record. People can say whatever they want, especially during elections. The question is, what have you done? It's my great honor to serve you as a member of Congress, especially during these difficult times. As New York battles out from under the shadow of coronavirus and the murder of George Floyd, I know that I have a special responsibility to fight for New York's fair share, to stand up to people like Senator Mitch McConnell, and to push for legislation to combat systemic racism. That's what I've done and continue to do. I believe that everything I've done in my professional life has prepared me for this particular job at this challenging time. I'm trained as a lawyer and a CPA. I was the mayor of my hometown and the county executive of Nassau County. Now I serve in Congress on the Powerful Ways and Means Committee, and the speaker appointed me to a special congressional commission on human rights in China. So what's my record? Well, I've dramatically increased the funding for New York hospitals during coronavirus and hope to do the same for New York State and our local municipalities over the next few weeks. I'm the lead member of Congress fighting to restore the deduction for the state and local tax deduction, SALT. As the co-chair of the Long Island Sound Caucus, I've increased the funding to clean up the Long Island Sound by 500%. I've dramatically increased the funding to clean up the Na Navy Grumman Plume. That's why I've been endorsed by the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters. I've co-sponsored every major piece of gun legislation, uh, gun violence prevention legislation, voted for background checks and red flag laws, and led, and led the fight to increase taxes on cigarettes and teenage vaping. That's why I've been endorsed by the Brady Campaign and Linda Beagle Schumann. I've fought for immigration reform, to expand healthcare coverage, and to make healthcare and prescription drugs more affordable. I've been endorsed by the AFL-CIO, the Long Island Building Trades, and have an A rating from the Children's Defense Fund, the Humane Society, and the National Education Association. I've secured millions of dollars for the Northport VA and for apprenticeship programs and so much more. I hope in the next 90 minutes, we'll listen for acts, not words. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Michael? I'm gonna turn, on the, turn up the light just a little bit. Pardon me. I hope that doesn't cut into his two minutes. No, we'll be gracious. <laughs> Much better. Thank you. Okay, now your time's starting. The river. So my name is Michael Weinstock, and I'm running for Congress. And this is a dream come true. I am blessed to be sitting here and participating in this election in, in so many ways. When I was in high school, I was lucky enough to join the volunteer fire department in Great Neck. And it was the best decision I ever made. The fire department not only helped me uh, learn the, the fundamentals of, of being a firefighter, but so much more. Both of my parents struggled with alcohol. When I was growing up, my dad wasn't around and my mom, her problems spiraled. When the men and women of the fire department learned about what was going on, they took care of me. They took me into their homes and they became role models and, and family members in every respect. Because of the members of the fire department, I was able to go to college and they pushed me to go to law school. When I graduated, I became an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, and I volunteered to work in the Sex Crimes Bureau. I spent five years protecting women, and sometimes men, who were the victims of sex crimes and domestic violence. It was the toughest job I ever had, and, and it was challenging. And in a lot of ways, it was even tougher than being a firefighter. When you show up on a fire truck, people are thrilled that you're there, and they want your help. When you're helping women who are the victims of sex crimes and domestic violence, they need your help but oftentimes they don't want your help. But so it's, it's powerfully important work. The last few years I've continued in public service and I've continued to, to, to do well in my neighborhood and I continue to try to do good deeds. A dear friend of mine is, is an older gentleman and he told me that when he was a little boy, he helped hide a, a Jewish family from the Nazis. I helped him find that Jewish family. And last year we were all honored. We were flown out to the Vatican and Pope Francis blessed the family for, for their heroism during the war and Pope Francis thanked me for my volunteer work reuniting everybody. I will do my best to continue public service and I'll do my best to work just as hard and do the right thing by New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank uh, you. Now, now we'll start with the first prepared question, the opening question. Uh, Tom, this will start with you. Um, if elected, you will be representing the population of New York CD3. What issues have you identified in your campaigns that are unique to our area and how would you address them? And this is 90 seconds now for these questions. 
Well, the issues that are unique to our area are really the Long Island Sound. I think that's the real unique thing that we all share across the third CD. And that's why I'm so proud of my accomplishments as the co-chair of the Long Island Sound Caucus to increase the funding uh, for the Long Island Sound cleanup by over 500% since I've first entered into Congress. Uh, there's other issues like the Beth Page Plume uh, that's been around for 40 years uh, that I helped increase the funding uh, to clean up that facility as well and did so much more that uh, uh, to try and help move that project along. People are so frustrated with that issue for so long. The Northport VA is a terribly derelict facility within our district and I've helped to bring money to resurrect that facility and I'm hoping there's going to be a major demolition of the two major structures that looked so awful when you first pull in to the Northport VA sometime uh, this summer. And uh, there are other issues with helicopter noise in the northeastern part of Queens and uh, air traffic noise in all parts of, of the district uh, that are much better now because nobody's flying as much. Uh, and then there are issues that we share in common with everybody else. Certainly the coronavirus is, is a unique issue for us only because we represent three of the six hardest hit counties in the United States of America. And we have to get the funding to our state despite the protestations of people like Mitch McConnell who are saying that our state should file for bankruptcy instead, and they don't want to do a blue state bailout. Uh, so there's so many other issues that are unique to our district, but the ones we share in common are coronavirus, uh, the George Floyd murder and the need for racial justice in the United States of America, the need to provide affordable health care and prescription drugs. Uh, there are special issues that we face here related to each of those three major things that we share in common with the rest of the United States of America, but there are uh, issues that are unique to us related to uh, coronavirus, that we're the number one place in America, the epicenter, uh, to the George Floyd, Floyd murders, that we have one of the most segregated places in the country right here on Long Island. Uh, and uh, with healthcare, it's just very expensive to obtain healthcare in this region uh, because of the cost of our hospitals and our doctors, specific to the New York cost of living as well. Okay, thank you. Same question, Michael? Sure. Um, in one of the most special places in New York, which of course makes it the most special place in the world. And, and I say that because I, I mean it. And while it's incredibly diverse from Little Neck and, and Douglaston to, to, to Great Neck to Hicksville, there's a lot of diversity, but one thing that we all have in common, if you ask any family, why did you live here and why do you stay here? It's because of the educational system. It's the crown jewel of New York State, if not the country, time after time after again, Schools on Long Island and Queens are listed among the top 10, and, and they're almost always public schools. So I, I intend to make education my top priority going to Congress. I'm gonna do everything I can to make college more affordable. And if you ask these people their biggest challenge, of course, it's staying in the area because taxes are so darn high. Taxes are very, very high. They're high in large part because Mr. Swazi, when he was county executive, raised them by 23%. So I will do everything I can to focus on education, and I'll do my best to bring back tax dollars to New York because so many families here are struggling and it's time to even that playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Melody? Great, thank you. Um, certainly, wealth inequality is a huge issue for us on Long Island, and we see this play out in a variety of issues. Um, certainly with healthcare, it's one of the reasons I do support universal healthcare. All along the, the campaign trail, I hear story after story of folks in our district who can't afford their medical bills, who can't afford their medicine. And it's time that Congress change that. Um, specific to the district, you know, the Congressman mentioned a few issues that I think we agree on here tonight. Airplane noise is certainly an issue for many in our district. What we do need, though, is for Congress to have some accountability there. Um, you know, they're tr we're trying so hard to figure out how we fix this issue. The airplane industry blames the FAA and vice versa. We need Congress to hold some hearings so that we can address that issue. I'm glad the Congressman brought up the Beth Page plume. Uh, I think if we're serious about fighting climate change, I think if we're serious about water security issues and ridding our Beth Page plume of the carcinogenic pollution that exists within it, we have to not take money from the maybe polluting uh, company that created that plume. Uh, and that is something that I, I would love for all the candidates to uh, on this call right now to, to commit to stop taking money from Long Island's biggest polluters uh, and the fossil fuel industry. So that is an issue that continues to plague 
uh, Long Island, and it is an issue that has been around, as the Congressman absolutely pointed out, for a very, very long time. It has to make us all wonder, why have we not done anything about it? So that is something that I am committed to cleaning up and to working with and holding folks accountable in that particular agency. Um, also, I would say that um, you know, we have a very large population of undocumented people in our district, and we need a humane and dignified path to citizenship. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about immigration in more depth in a little while, um, but unfortunately, we've had a Congress that has turned their back on immigrants in this country. And New York is truly the melting pot of, of the country. It's what makes New York so wonderfully diverse. Uh, it makes our community so wonderful. So we need to welcome the immigrant and ensure that we have uh, a dignified path to citizenship for them. Thank you. Okay, Tom, rebuttal. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, you know, I neglected to mention some issue that people don't realize is so unique or is something that affects our district more than other places in America. And that is the capping of the SALT deduction, the state and local tax deduction. It's probably one of the biggest issues I've worked on uh, since I've been in Congress. Uh, I am really the lead in the Congress for the Democrats to try and restore uh, the SALT deduction. Uh, we passed legislation last December out of the House uh, to restore the SALT deduction, but it was killed in the Senate like so many other bills have died on Mitch McConnell's desk. Uh, in addition, I worked very hard to get uh, a bipartisan coalition as well as most of the Democrats in America uh, to push to have the res restoration of the SALT deduction put into the HEROES Act. The fact that it's still part of the negotiations uh, is a great accomplishment. Can we get it done as part of the final deal to be made uh, related to the next deal related to the CARES Act, related to uh, addressing the coronavirus? I don't know. It'll require a big trade with the Republicans. Uh, but it's something that's so important to us because our taxes are much higher than most places in the United States of America. Not only our property taxes, uh, but our state taxes as well. That's why I pushed for the property tax cap when I ran for governor. The running for governor didn't turn out too well, but I did help get a property tax cap in the United States and uh, in New York State. And the county taxes, Michael, should know, are about 15% of your tax. You. Your tax okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question starts with Michael. Uh, this one is on the economy. What policies would you support to offset state government's ongoing loss of revenues due to the pandemic? I'll, I'll answer that, but first I, I just want to touch base um, for just a second about something Mr. Swazi just said about the, uh, the, the, the restoration of the SALT deduction. Okay, but remember you only get 90 seconds on sure, this. Sure, you, you bet. Um, Mr. Swazi keeps bringing this up. Over and over again, he he, uh, he released a, a press statement months ago about the the salt deduction, um, and Mitch McConnell said there's no chance that this is going to pass. And then President Trump said, if a Christmas miracle occurs and this bill should pass, I guarantee I'm going to veto it. Nonetheless, Mr. Swazi got a lot of press, a lot of press, uh, and people weren't talking about Mr. Swazi raising taxes anymore. They were talking about this bill proposing to lower taxes, and and it didn't happen. And I thought Mr. Swazi would go on to take leadership on something else. But here we are during the, the COVID crisis. And instead of taking leadership on related issues related to the COVID crisis, Mr. Swazi is recycling the same proposal that he knows isn't going to pass because it gets his face in the newspapers discussing the reduction of property tax and, and the hopes that people will stop talking about the fact that he raised property taxes by 23%. Uh, getting to your question, I'd like to see more money get in the hands of people who really, really need it rather than corporations. And um, for instance, the, the checks that, that went out to all Americans and not just to the people through the unemployment system, because those are the people who are really struggling during this crisis. Thank you. Okay, Melanie? Yes, um, I think that, the, I'm sure we'll talk about the CARES Act as well in, in more depth, but I think it was wholly mishandled. Um, as Michael Apley pointed out, it prioritized corporations over people. What we needed to see were re reoccurring stimulus payments to individuals. What we needed to see was a credit freeze. What we needed to see was a not just a freeze on mortgage and rent payments, but a policy that would ensure that folks could pay at the end of their loan or at the end or in arrears if, if they were paying rent so that they could pay a little bit out of out at a time. The reality is that millions of folks have lost their jobs, uh, millions have lost their employer-based health care. 
And unfortunately, folks are not going to magically be able to come up with three months worth of mortgage payments or three months worth of rent payments. Now, Governor Cuomo uh, pointed out, I don't even know how many times he pointed out that the New York delegation did not fight hard enough for New York. And he was right. Because in the four coronavirus bills that have been passed, there has been no state aid. Now there's a fifth one that maybe might have it. Thanks to Representative Maxine Waters, who pushed for the municipality liquidity facility, we may have an opportunity to borrow money, but he, the Congress did not fight for New York. So we need state aid. Um, you know, the HEROES Act does have it included in it, but there's also a lot of, um, a lot of poison in that bill as well. So hopefully, we'll, hopefully our Congress will be able to fight and get us the state aid that we need, because we were the hardest hit area in the country. Tom? Let me just correct some of the facts. There was $150 billion in state aid in the previous uh, CARES Act that were passed with the, uh, almost bi unanimous bipartisan consent. Uh, all the bills that have been passed so far have been uh, bipartisan. Now the HEROES Act, which has been passed by the Democratic Congress with one vote from Peter King and from the Republicans, is stuck in the Senate. Uh, it's a big focus of mine is to address this issue of lost revenues in the state of New York. Uh, when we first passed the CARES Act, there was $100 billion for hospitals throughout the country. But uh, with the first tranche of money was distributed by the Health and Human Services, $30 billion, more money went to Texas, which at the time had 2.5% of the cases, than came to New York City hospitals and New York State hospitals, which at the time had 35% of the cases. So now I've worked and I got every Democrat and every Republican in New York and New Jersey to sign a letter to Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell to create a special fund to be distributed to New York based upon the rate of infection, based upon all the states, based upon the rate of infection. New York will get from that bill almost $21 billion, most of that money coming from the idea that I specifically proposed with every Democrat and every Republican in New York and New Jersey. If I get that done, it'll probably be one of my biggest accomplishments in my entire public service career. Right now, it's right on the table, and the Democrats and the Republicans in New York State will not negotiate down that number. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, Melanie, this one starts with you. Also on the economy, what policies would you pursue to support small business in the state during this economic crisis? Thank you. Well, you know, as we saw in, in the CARES Act, um, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program had a lot of faults. What we saw was, uh, you know, while well, it was certainly intended for small businesses, we saw large businesses pillaging that fund. In fact, 4% um, four, four of the businesses took 45% of all the money. So uh, we saw that it had a lot of issues there. And even the Main Street Lending Program, which was designed for medium businesses, had loopholes that allowed yacht companies and private jet companies to access money. These are programs that were designed to help struggling businesses. What we saw was that businesses who were not struggling, businesses that were not hit, like businesses that were hit in in New York or other hotspot areas, uh, we're able to access money at greater rates. So we need more accountability and we certainly need to ensure that we can keep our businesses afloat. But I also think that this is an opportunity for us, right? Uh, unfortunately, this global pandemic has affected us all and no one will get really become uh, or come out of it unscathed. It's an opportunity for us to rebuild in a green way and incentivize um, green jobs and green infrastructure and you know, green retrofitting. This is an opportunity for us to begin to tackle uh, the problem of climate change. And I hope that we have a Congress that is committed to that. Thank you. Tom? Lisa, could you repeat the question for me, please? Sure. What policies would you pursue to support small business in the state during this economic crisis? So the main thing that was done was uh, the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that uh, Melanie pointed out that many of the uh, bigger small companies, small businesses, small businesses, 500 employees or less, a lot of the bigger small businesses got most of the money uh, in the first round. And we went in and worked on correcting that. In fact, I led a bipartisan delegation from every member on Long Island, uh, myself, Kathleen Rice, Greg Meeks, Peter King, and Lee Zeldin, and said, did a press conference and said to the banks, we're watching you. We want you to look out for the little guys. We want you to look out for the mom and pop stores, the electricians and the plumbers and the doctors and the dentists that are getting crushed right now and haven't gotten the loans. And we also went to the SBA and the Treasury Department and said, we need you to give better guidance. In America, there are 30 million small businesses, 30 million small businesses, of which 84% have less than 20 employees. 
Well, we saw the average loan side size go from $280,000 a loan down to about $80,000 a loan as the, as the second tranche of the program uh, came out. And it's in, helped a lot of businesses, but there were still many problems. There wasn't enough flexibility. Uh, they had to spend their money within eight weeks. Uh, they could have had to spend it by the end of June or July. Uh, we changed that. The Democrats led on that. The Republicans finally did it. The president finally signed it just last week where you can have 24 weeks to spend the money and you can spend it through December 31st. So there's so much more that needs to be done. The biggest, most important thing that needs to be done for all business, including small business, is we need a massive infrastructure program, which does need to be green. Uh, and we need to make sure that we get the economy stimulated. Right now, we've been working on recovery, recovery, dealing with the crisis. Now we need to stimulate the economy. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be coming out with a massive uh, infrastructure program out of the house that will have a very big green component. And I'm very proud to have been endorsed by the Sierra Club and the New York League of Conservation Voters because I'm the green candidate here that's been honored, <laughs> been honored by Al Gore in the past, as well as many other environmental organizations. Okay, thank you. Michael, your answer? Thank you, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be discourteous. Um, I'll, 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 I'll rein in. Um, every community in the country is, is being impacted by COVID and it's gonna be tough on, on everyone, but it's especially hitting hard on communities that are educationally and economically disadvantaged. And that, I spent a long time in Brooklyn and I have a lot of friends in Brooklyn and, and Brooklyn is a very diverse and, and, and wonderful place. And I thought of Brooklyn when I was completing my own application for the PPP program. I have a law firm. I have a law firm uh, that's been doing pretty well for the last eight years. But now every single courthouse is closed in New York. Nobody's signing up clients and, and things are tight. So I filled out an application with the PPP program. It required tax documents upon tax documents on tax document for three years and, and four quarters each time. And it was a little bit crushing. I had to call my accountant over and over again. And the whole time I'm thinking, if I'm having trouble with this and I have a law degree, what's going on in Brooklyn with the, with the people who have small businesses? Are they able to come up with these documents? Are they able to deal with all this bureaucracy? And the answer is no, no, they're not. So we need to, to push forward with a program that's more empathetic to people who don't have reams and reams and IRS documents, but are struggling just as much or even more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question actually goes to a subject that some of you have already addressed, but because it's on my question list, I'd like you all to summarize your thoughts on this. Tom, we start with you. Uh, do you support or oppose repealing the $10,000 cap on tax deductibility of state and local taxes, salt deduction, and why? Again, most of you have had comments on this, but give us your summary now. You know, it's, it's again, one of my biggest priorities, something that I'm fighting for on a regular basis, trying to educate not only Democrats, but Republicans throughout the country uh, to try and make them understand how devastating this is to New York. First of all, in New York and Long Island specifically, our district, we are huge net donors to the federal government. We send a lot more money to the federal government than we get back in uh, services or in contracts. And we are, one of the only good things that we've had in the tax policy in the past was the, the deduction of state and local taxes. We're one of the hardest hit places in the country by the cap that the Republicans put in in 2017. So I'm doing everything I can to try and get that cap repealed. Uh, but it's hard because the country is so different from place to place, the, from region to region. Uh, someone in, a, in our district uh, has a much higher taxes and a much more valuable home than someone in Oklahoma or in North Dakota or in Iowa. So when we say we have $15,000 in taxes on our home and our house is worth four hundred dollars or $500,000, someone in Oklahoma says, wow, you must be loaded. You must be so rich. When in reality, someone who's got a home like that in, in, in this particular congressional district is really a middle of the road person. So there's a great lack of understanding. So it's so important to build relationships in Congress to not only educate yourself about what it's like in other places in the country, but for them to understand what it's like here in our district. I've had so many people call me crying, a husband and wife both working $150,000 a year between the two of them, $400,000 home, and they are crushed by their taxes. Thank you. Michael? Yes, yes. Um, there's a reason that people are crushed by their taxes, because when Mr. Swazi was county executive, he, he pushed them up by 23%. And this, uh, this salt deduction, this, this restoration of the salt deduction, it stands not an inkling of a tinkling of, of passing. The, the 
majority leader made it very clear. He said, not a chance. And then the president said, I'm going to veto it. This is an example of Mr. Swazi engaging in stunts for press attention. Every time he, he goes on television, it, it talks about Tom Swazi and it has the words tax reduction and he's pleased. If Tom wants to push this forward, terrific. I would prefer if he would hold a press conference when he actually accomplishes something. Not when he says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to lower your taxes. Get it, as my grandfather would say, show me, don't tell me. Get it passed and then you can crow about it. Until then, please stop holding press conferences saying, I'm going to do this this time. I, this is my, my COVID salt deduction. This is my Christmas time salt deduction. If you, if you make it happen, terrific. But I, I'd, I'd rather see your leadership where it's needed right now, for instance, on, on COVID issues. Thank you. Okay, Melanie? Thank you. Um, yes, of course, I support a repeal of the SALT deduction. Um, you know, Congressman Swazi talks a lot about bipartisanship. I think it's how he's defined his, um, his tenure in Congress. It's how he's defined his candidacies. He serves as the vice chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is my understanding that it, it, the whole in caucus is really built around bipartisanship. It's comprised of an equal amount of Republicans and an equal amount of uh, what I consider to be conservative Democrats. Uh, I wonder why we can't use that bipartisanship that Mr. Swazi talks about so frequently to get bipartisanship consensus on something like assault deduction uh, or, or many other bills for that matter. Um, you know, bipartisanship certainly is the dream. I, I will agree with the congressman on that. It is the dream. We should be able to work in a bipartisan manner. But what we have seen under a Trump administration and a GOP that has really abandoned the Republican Party and really lined up right behind Donald Trump is that we're not negotiating in good faith with the Republicans. So I question, um, you know, why Mr. Swazi continues to serve on this caucus that really has not given us any legislative wins other than weakening Democratic power in the House by holding up Nancy Pelosi's speakership uh, early on. I, I, I would love you know, to, to hear some of those answers. Um, but what I do think is that repealing SALT is not enough for, strong, uh, for Long Island struggling families. I think that we need to rebalance the tax structure. And I think that we need to ensure that corporations are paying their fair share in federal taxes. I mean, how it's just not a fair system right now when we see large almost what's soon to be a trillion dollar corporations not paying anything in federal taxes. Okay, Tom, rebuttal. You know, something that's important for people to realize is that governing is very tough, it's really hard. And you have to work at it over a long period of time. You have to push and push and push. And I'm very proud of the fact that I got a salt bill passed through the house, despite the fact that Donald Trump and, and Mitch McConnell say that they're against doing it. I'm gonna keep on fighting for that because it's the right thing to do. And I'm gonna keep on trying to persuade people how important it is to the people in our district. So the idea of just laying back and saying, oh, they said they won't do it, let's stop pushing for it, will never stop me from fighting for the things that I believe in. And as far as working together in bipartisan with the Problem Solvers Caucus, well, the most important criminal justice reform in our country in the past 30 years was supported by the Problem Solvers Caucus, where you had everybody from Grover Norquist, the farthest right Republican you could possibly think of, to Van Jones, the former CNN uh, uh, correspondent. So the idea that uh, you know we shouldn't try and work on bipartisan legislation is absurd. The way that we got the 9-11 uh, compensation, Victims Compensation Fund passed so quickly through the House was because of the Problem Solvers Caucus worked together on that. So there's so many different things that have been accomplished Related, the Never Again Education Act for Holocaust education was pushed by the Problem Solvers Caucus. The rules changes that you poo poo uh, was pushed by the uh, Problem Solvers Caucus that resulted in the Congress being more bipartisan and more transparent. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, can I'll I do, Can I rebut as well, or are we not allowed to do that? Yeah, no, you can. You, okay. get, you get a minute. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have characterized me as poo pooing the rules, but I think. The reality is that many of us worked really hard in 2018 to push back against a Trump agenda. We, we worked really hard. In fact, Congressman Swazi, I handed out palm cards for you. I did that because I thought you were going to be a check on the Trump administration, not a welcome mat. Holding up Nancy Pelosi's speakership after we had just finally clawed back some, some power in government, choosing that moment in history to hold up her speakership to weaken Democratic power and give power to the Republicans so that they can also bring bills to the floor, I think, I think is really irresponsible. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one more question under uh, the 
uh, heading of economy. It's a very long question. Michael, we're going to start with you, so um, bear with me. I'm reading what I was given. The health and economic crises caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted Congress to borrow close to $5 trillion without consideration of a second wave in the fall. Taxes for the wealthy and large corporations have been dramatically reduced in the past three years, and bills for COVID-19 relief have provisions for reducing these taxes even further. How will you, as a congressional representative from Long Island, ensure that the federal, state, and local tax burden does not fall on the shoulders of the individual and small businesses, the backbone of this country. If I'm elected to Congress, I will work doggedly to make sure that we've got more money coming, to, coming back to New York. And that's not the case right now. We have so much more money leaving New York and going to places like, like Virginia and, and Iowa. So I, I'm gonna do my best to bring more money back. And I'm gonna do my best to, to also level the playing field when it comes to that money. Right now, just recently, we learned about money that, that's going to the, the agricultural industry in Iowa to compensate them for COVID losses that haven't yet occurred. And that's just one more example of, of the inefficiency that's going on. So if I'm elected, I'll fight very, very hard for the New York interests. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Melanie? I yeah, I was on mute. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The health economic crisis has been... Uh, really off the charts here in New York. In fact, we've had to transform our campaign and we collected food all over the district. Um, we, we were able to deliver food to undocumented families, food to needy families, PPE to doctors and nurses. Um, I even delivered food to Glen Cove, the congressman's hometown. Um, there were a lot of moms there who needed diapers and formula. Uh, so it's really uh, not just hitting us from a tax perspective, but it is hitting people on a very personal level in the sense that they can't feed their children. So I'm, I'm very focused on what this pandemic has done to my district. Um, and what I will be committed to doing when I get to Congress is putting people first, something that these stimulus bills have failed to do. And I outlined what I would do earlier, what I would do differently. Um, you know, and, and you just previously with the former question, we do need to restructure our taxes. We cannot no longer allow the tax burden to fall on middle-class families in Queens and Long Island. We need to ensure that the extremely wealthy, we're talking the 0.1% are paying their fair share in taxes. And we need to make sure that corporations are paying their fair share in taxes. Okay, thank you, Tom. Well, there's no question that the worst thing done by this administration and by the Republicans when they controlled Congress completely was the 2017 tax bill. Uh, it was completely devastating to New York and to families throughout America. It exacerbated the debt in this country extraordinarily, uh, and it gave tax cuts to the wealthiest people in the United States of America. In fact, when I was proposing my first salt bill, it was to, uh, to pay for it, was to raise the taxes on the wealthiest Americans at the very top rate from 37 back to 39.6 that was cut back in 2017, which was just absurd. And when they reduced the corporate tax rate, they reduced it down to 20% where they were, the corporate industries were only asking for 25% and Obama proposed about 28%. So it's absurd that they have reduced it as much as they did. No, taxes should not go up on middle-class folks, should not go up on uh, small businesses. Uh, but the spending that we're doing right now, every economist has said, and again, you know, we hear about Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is very proud of the accomplishments that have been made in these four bills that have happened thus far. Uh, every economist says the only mistake you can make now is not spending enough money to address these problems. The stimulus into the economy by giving people unemployment checks, by giving people stimulus checks, by helping small businesses, by investing in our hospitals, by sending money to our states and local governments, and we need to give a lot more to our state and local governments, and I'm on the forefront of getting money back to New York State and to our local municipalities, uh, it is essential. And it's being held up by the Republicans in the Senate right now, and we need to keep on fighting for New York. Everybody on this uh, Zoom call should agree that our biggest priority should be bringing money back to New York. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, this next one starts with you. We're moving on to the environment. Uh, the question is, the climate change crisis is upon us. Long Island faces challenges in sustaining clean water 
due to the pollution of the aquifer, what initiatives would you propose in increasing the sustainability of our water supply for future generations? Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely, you're right. Um, you know, not only do we have polluted aquifers, but our climate crisis, as, as the planet heats up and seas rise, continues to push against our aquifer systems, causing saltwater intrusion, uh, which is very, very expensive, if not uh, impossible in some parts of the world to purify. Uh, we will have a water security issue on Long Island, and it is one of my top priorities. Uh, we do need cleaning up pollution, uh, as, as I think most of us are aware on this call, uh, the chief polluter, top polluter on Long Island was supposed to pay $585 million to rectify and remediate the Bethpage plume, but is fighting back against it. Um, you know, as a Congresswoman, I would be committed to figuring out how to stop federal contracts until the company who has polluted our, our aquifer system cleans it up. Um, we need to just inc make sure that we are constantly investing and we need to educate our community. Uh, you know, in Long Island, folks are very proud of their lawns, right? That, that's one of those quintessential Long Island moments where everyone has a lawn or you know, people who have homes have lawns. And um, nitrogen-based fertilizer is ruining our you know, runoffs, it's ruining our, um, our aquifer system. There are certain products that have chemicals in it that are getting washed down the drain and um, polluting other aquifers on Long Island. And so we need a massive educational push and we need to ban certain chemicals here in the United States so that we are not polluting our groundwater source. Okay, thank you. Tom? You know, cleaning up pollution has been a passion of mine my entire life. Uh, back even when I was mayor of Glen Cove, Al Gore named Glen Cove a showcase brownfield community, a model in the nation for cleaning up polluted sites when I was helping to clean up two federal Superfund sites and New York State hazardous waste sites. In 2008, I was named the Environmentalist of the Year for all of New York State by the New York League of Conservation Voters. And now this year, of course, I'm endorsed by the Sierra Club and the League of Conservation Voters and the Long Island Environmental for Forum, as I am in most of my races that I've ever run for because I'm so committed to keeping our air, land, and water as clean as possible. I talked earlier about the Long Island Sound cleanup, uh, but one of the most important things that I've pushed in the Ways and Means Committee is that part of any infrastructure bill that we do, we must include money for sewers and water. We need that money here on Long Island, especially on the North Shore of Suffolk County and those places in Nassau County that aren't sewered, that have cesspools, and that are affecting not only the Long Island Sound, but our aquifer, as you mentioned. And in addition, I've worked as one of my biggest priorities locally has been cleaning up the Bethpage plume. And if you talk to the water commissioners of the Bethpage Water District, they'll tell you that Tom Swazi has been the most effective politician fighting for them on a regular basis. Now we have a long way to go. It's been there for 40 years, but I have a lot of experience in breaking through the bureaucracy to get clean up site, to hold Northrop Grumman accountable, to hold the Navy accountable, and to hold the polluters accountable, and to get the state, the DEC, to work together with all the different levels of government to keep this process moving. So uh, I've devoted my life to public service and a big part of that has been related to environmental cleanup of our air land and water and i'm 100 percent committed to continuing to do that not only on these issues but on climate change and everything else as well thank you thank, thank you michael when it comes to the climate crisis we should do everything humanly possible Every, everything and when it comes to the cleanup of of the aquifers when it comes to the beth page plume and other superfund sites we need to clean them up as quickly as possible. There are some things that you can procrastinate about. This isn't one of them. Whether whether Grumman is going to pay or, or another co-defendant is going to pay, is, it doesn't matter. But the longer we wait, the more that plume is going to keep continue traveling underground and, uh, and creating more damage and risk other people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Melanie? Yes, buddy? yes, yes, thank you. Um, Newsday did an expose, in, it came out in February, and Newsday reported that Northrop Grumman knew about the plume, for, has known about the plume for 40 years. Northrop Grumman has also, uh, Grumman has also, I'm sorry, Newsday has also reported that elected officials knew about this plume for all of this time. Uh, you know, Mr. Swazi has been a politician for a very long time here on Long Island, for over 20 years. He served as county executive over that particular area for 10 years. And here we are today, and the plume is four miles by two miles, and it is 900 feet deep. 
So while I appreciate the words, you know, Mr. Swazi talked earlier about action and not words. Do action and not words. The words sound very nice. Let's clean it up. But where has been, the, where's, where's the action on it? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I've dramatically increased the funding for the cleanup of the Beth Page, uh, the Navy Grumman plume. Uh, I've, that's why the commissioners have all said that I'm one of the most effective people they've ever had helping them to clean up the Navy Grumman plume. Uh, so I, I'm very experienced in this area. I'm working very hard on it. It's very frustrating that it's taking so long. That's how government and bureaucracy often works, especially when you're fighting with responsible parties to put up the money. But I've been, I've been pushing this thing further along and faster along than it's been in a long, long time. Still got a long, long way to go, but uh, I'm not at the forefront of pushing it forward. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, uh, Tom, this starts with you. Also on the environment, since we live on an island, we need federal assistance in developing and implementing a plan to address the threat of rising sea levels to our communities. How would you support the funding for such an initiative? I think that it has to be part of any uh, infrastructure bill that the Congress passes, and we hope to be passing one with a bipartisan uh, support uh, this year. I, you know, an infrastructure bill was dead in the water uh, earlier this year, uh, according to Mitch McConnell and President Trump. Uh, but now with the coronavirus, it's been put on the front burner again as a way to stimulate the economy, especially with interest rates as low as they are. And, you know, we have to do everything we can to stop temperatures from rising and to stop sea levels from rising. But we now also, because of the reality of the situation, have to work on resiliency. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers had a plan that they wanted to propose uh, to build massive gates uh, just east of the Throgs Neck Bridge to try and protect Ma uh, Manhattan from surge flooding uh, in the Cape, like it was during Hurricane Sandy. And there were gates in other places as well. But that water would have backed up to the North Shore of Long Island and Queens. And so I fought against them doing that and forced them to do public hearings, and they backed off that plan uh, in the interim. So we need to have resilience. We need to understand where the places are that are suffering right now. I'm working with Asher Roken, for example. There are some places in Glen Cove that are problems. There are some places on the uh, uh, Manhasset, Port Washington Peninsula, some places on the Great Neck Peninsula, and some places in Queens. So resilience is very, very important. Uh, and that requires a lot of money. And that's why it has to be part of any infrastructure bill that we have. And, you know, people don't talk about it, but in the National Defense Authorization Act about three years ago, for the first time, Republicans voted that the U.S. military has to consider climate change and the rising sea levels as part of our long-term military strategy. We've got about 20 Republicans to support that, finally. Thank you. Michael? If, I'm, look, if I become a member of Congress, I'm going to spend just as much time working hard on the stuff that isn't sexy as the stuff that makes headlines. And that means getting money for infrastructure programs, as well as things that, that people don't talk about, like better traffic signals, which cut down on greenhouse gases. When I'm elected, I, I intend to, to do the heavy lifting and work on that stuff that's really important. I won't simply conduct stunts to get press attention. I'll do the heavy lifting and I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the hard work that needs to be done. Thank you. Okay, uh, Melanie. Yep, thank you. Uh, well, certainly we have to fortify our shorelines. And, and as the congressman pointed out, uh, we're at a position in time now where we have to play both offense and defense. For way too long, our government has kicked the can of climate change down the road, and now we're at the end of the road. It is certainly the existential crisis of our generation. And we, the science is very clear. We have 10 years to reduce greenhouse gas emissions drastically by 40 to 50 percent in the next 10 years. Otherwise, we face a irreparable damage. So the only way we, are, we see our way out of this is if we start implementing solutions and realizing a Green New Deal right now. That means working on solutions to transition to renewable energy. It means constantly working and innovating ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It means focusing on frontline communities, and it means ushering in a new green economy with green jobs. There, are, there, There's so much science to support this. And, and frankly, it's so discouraging sitting in on hearings in Congress and hearing uh, folks complain about whether or not the science is real. Uh, we, you, you can have a lot of opinions, you can have a lot of ideas on approaches, but we cannot refute the science. Uh, you know, this goes back to uh, why it's so frustrating, you know, uh, when Congressman Swazi talks about bipartisanship. 
the, the environment used to not be a partisan issue, and it shouldn't be today. It affects every single one of us, whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, or an unaffiliated voter, or an undocumented person. It is truly affecting us all. And what we need right now is a solution that will match the intensity of the crisis. And right now, the only solution put forth to do that is a Green New Deal, so we should all get behind it and push, not call it a fantasy land like Congressman Swazi did recently. Okay, thank you. Um, there was one additional question on the environment, but it dealt with the Beth, Beth Page plume, and um, we did get comments from all three of you on that. What I would remind you all is that you'll have an opportunity in your closing statements to address some of the things you'd want to drive home at the end of the evening. So we're moving on to voting rights, and uh, Michael, this one starts with you. To what extent would you seek federal support to states to extend voting rights like mail-in ballots in light of the COVID-19 pandemic? It's uh, the fact that New York State finally for this election is, is, is engaging in, in mail-in ballots has been a long time coming. And this is an issue that's spoken to me for many, many years. After Hurricane Sandy, I actually went to visit a friend in North Shore Hospital. And one thing led to another, and I went from room to room collecting absentee ballots from hospitalized patients. The next day, I ended up in front of a New York State Supreme Court justice fighting to have these 15 hospitalized patients vote. I was successful, and the Supreme Court justice not only ruled in my favor, but she, she said that I'm a fine lawyer who makes democracy look good throughout the state of New York. Hospitalized patients should not require volunteer lawyers to go to the Supreme Court to get them to vote. The, the mail-in ballot, ballot initiative should have happened many, many years ago. I'm glad that Governor Cuomo is finally making it happen now, and God willing, it'll be the first step. When I'm a member of Congress, I'm going to continue pushing this issue forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Melanie? Thank you. Uh, yes, I also believe that we need funding for mail-in ballots. Uh, we don't know if there will be a second wave of COVID. We need to prepare for it. Um, although I, I disagree somewhat a little bit with Michael. Um, you know, the process in New York, this isn't a federal issue, it's a state issue. It, it's not really a mail-in ballot, right? We have to send in an application and then we have to send in a ballot. So I think New York State has to change that. Uh, it would be nice to have um, a true mail-in program like we see over in Washington, where there was a 65% turnout rate. We don't have that here. Uh, I'm in favor of any initiative that would increase voter turnout. I think that, you know, we certainly, you know, like I'm a member of the league and I, I believe in my heart and in my core that we need to increase civic engagement if we truly, uh, you know, believe in democracy and we want everyone to participate. Okay, thank you. Tom? H.R. 1, which was the first piece of legislation that we passed in the Democratic Congress uh, this term in Congress, was to actually do exactly what you were talking to about, uh, to increase uh, uh, mail-in voting, to increase voter rights, uh, to make voting more accessible to people. Uh, part of the HEROES Act is to uh, provide money to states uh, to help encourage them to do mail-in ballots. New York State is the worst state as far as uh, Re requiring so many different different hurdles to overcome to both get on the ballot, uh, to vote. Uh, it's just much too difficult here. We should be doing mail-in ballots here uh, in New York State. We should be making it easier for people to vote. Uh, and it's something that I'm 100% committed to working on. And it's in the legislation of HR1. And it's in the HEROES Act, both of which I've supported robustly. Uh, so uh, we should be doing everything we can to make it easier for people to vote easier for people to run for office, uh, make things more transparent uh, so that people can know uh, who is running for office and what, how their laws are passed. So uh, I, I think that we can all agree on this and it's something I've been working on throughout my entire career. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question also under voting rights, Melanie, I'll start with you. Uh, the Citizens United decision opened up virtually unlimited donations to political campaigns. This decision has enabled corporations and special interest groups like PACs and super PACs to spend large amounts of money in an effort to influence our democracy. Many people would like to see the decision overturned. What can Congress do to reduce or eliminate the influence of the soft money coming into political campaigns? 
Um, well, first and foremost, we certainly need to overturn Citizens United. That will take a constitutional amendment. That is the, the long play. Um, what I'd like to see and what I've chosen to do in my campaign is to reject corporate PAC money. I believe when lobbyists and corporate PACs donate to campaigns, they expect a return on investment. And sooner or later, they're going to come knocking. And I think that's why Washington is so broken today. I think that's why we can't agree or get both sides to agree on anything today. It is the single biggest impediment to progress. And we see this with virtually every single issue, whether it's um, you know something as simple as background checks, which is supported even in the red states. We can't get universal background checks right now. Uh, and it's because because of so much money being dumped in. Unfortunately, Congressman Swazi has taken over a million dollars in corporate PAC money. And unfortunately, I see, and I've asked him this in the past, when he breaks with the party on key votes, like when he broke with the party to, to gut Dodd-Frank, when he broke with the party to support ICE and then vote for expanding detention centers, he always has corporate donors that benefit from these votes. Um, I have introduced, I've written my own proposal called the Paid By Act, Politician Accountability Information Disclosures, benefiting you, it's a mouthful. Uh, it, would, it would essentially introduce more transparency into the process. I don't believe that the average voter is aware of the negative effects of corporate money. I don't believe that they are aware that when there's so much money being dumped into a campaign, it influences our representatives' decisions. Uh, so this act, would essentially require a, a candidate or a sitting elected official to disclose their relevant or competing interests, whether in a vote or in a campaign ad. So it would run similar to a typical pharmaceutical ad that you see today, where it runs all of the issues, right? So for example, if Congressman Swazi uh, voted for the public option, if there was a vote and he voted for the public option, I think he still supports that. He can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he would have to disclose the relevant money he's taken from the insurance agency, uh, pharmaceutical industry, and uh, health supply agencies, so that Thank folks you. and regular voters would be able to see Thank you. for themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom? Yeah, every contribution every candidate gets is disclosed in their financial disclosure forms. Uh, I've been working on campaign finance reform uh, since I was a senior in law school in 1989. In fact, I worked on a thing called the New York State Commission on Government Integrity. The dean of my law school was the chairman of it. He was appointed by the governor at the time, Governor Mario Cuomo, and I worked pro bono on that effort. And as a result, I won the Ethics Award from the New York State Bar Association for that year uh, for the works that I, work that I did on campaign finance reform. And I've worked on it my entire career. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get campaign finance reform done. But when it comes to the, the decision of End Citizens United, it is crushing our politics and our debate here in the United States of America. That's why I've been endorsed by End Citizens United. They've endorsed my candidacy. In addition, we have to recognize the fact that uh, there's foreign money that's being used in a lot of campaigns as well that's not being disclosed, especially when it's going to corporate PACs like End Citizens United. Uh, like citizens, uh, like the the cases the affected by Citizens United decision. Uh, so uh, I helped to pass a bipartisan piece of um, uh, legislation, an amendment to HR one, uh, using the Problem Solvers Caucus, quite frankly, to investigate and disclose foreign investments uh, in companies that are making PAC contributions. Okay, thank you, Michael. Sure. His response, then you can rebut. My pleasure. Uh, a moment ago, uh, Congressman Swazi was referencing uh, John Furyk, uh, Dean John Furyk of Fordham Law School, who is a, a powerhouse and, and a role model of mine. I know Dean Furyk well because a, a couple years back, Dean Furyk and I co-wrote a book on campaign finance regulation and what we can do to make it more fair and more just. And the panacea, of course, is transparency. Transparency, transparency, transparency. Not just with campaign contributions. Tom says that he's provided full transparency because he's complied with the FEC regulations of the campaign. And that's not entirely accurate, of course. There's an awful lot of PAC money that, that goes undisclosed. That should stop immediately. And there should also be transparency when people receive contributions and they're speaking to groups. I've heard Tom Swazi, Congressman Swazi, on more than one occasion speak to families that have had their lives turned upside down because of opiates and the, the opiate crisis. He should always begin those conversations by saying, I want to talk to you about what's going on, but in, in full disclosure, I've received more than $35,000 from Shine Pharmaceuticals. Shine Pharmaceuticals 
has been in a great deal of trouble with the New York State Attorney General for the negligent distribution and manufacture of opiates. And he doesn't do that, and he doesn't have to, because the people he's speaking to have no idea that he's received more than $35,000 from this one multinational corporation that's been in trouble with so many attorney generals for the improper distribution of opiates. So I'm a huge fan of transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, you had a rebuttal? Yes, really quickly. Um, when Congressman Swazi says that every campaign contribution is disclosed, Michael is right. Uh, you can't always trace back super PAC money and, and sometimes even PAC money. Um, but the reality is most folks don't know how to sleuth through an FEC report. So this would make that process easier, my paid by act. Um, also, you know, to correct you, Michael, um, since 2015, Mr. Swazi has taken 78000 from Henry Stein. Um, and lastly, I just want to correct the record. When he says he's been endorsed by N Citizens United, uh, it has been exposed that that is a DCCC fundraising pack that does absolutely nothing to help end Citizens United. So I just wanted to set the record straight there. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question is on education. Uh, this one is going to start with Tom. Uh, COVID-19 has shined a harsh light on differences in education received by students in wealthier and poorer districts and raised many questions. Taxpayers may not be able to afford to fund education at current levels. What would you do, if elected, to support funding for our public schools? Let me first start by congratulating Michael on writing a book with Dean Furyk. I didn't know that, and that's a really major accomplishment. So I wanna congratulate you on that. Uh, and I'll try and look for that book. Um, let me say that uh, COVID-19 was the first real clarion call that everybody heard regarding racial disparities in the United States of America. Of course, there's been racial disparities for 401 years since the first slave was brought to the United States of America. And the disproportionate impact of death and sickness on persons of color uh, was really an eye opener for many people. I was well aware of it based upon the work I did as county executive to work on healthcare disparities. And actually we had a hearing in, in Ways and Means the other day and I talked about the issue of cultural competence and the need for more doctors and healthcare professionals that are people of color. And what we can do to encourage historically black colleges and medical schools and dental schools uh, to get more uh, persons of color in healthcare. Uh, but when it comes to schools and funding, probably the most important thing I'm working on right now, and we'll, again, I said earlier, would be one of my biggest accomplishments, was to get money distributed to the states in the United States of America based upon the rate of infection. The proposal that I put together and is now part of the Democrats' bill will result in almost $11 billion coming to the state of New York of its total 21 or $22 billion. That money will specifically be used for state aid to school districts so that they don't have to cut the schools and have layoffs in the schools. It's essential that more money be given to our schools here in New York State uh, because the state doesn't have the revenues come in so they can't give the money to the schools. Where are they gonna get the money from? You gotta get it from the federal government through the HEROES Act. It's the most important thing that Mitch McConnell is holding up right now that's going to dramatically impact uh, the schools here in New York State. Okay, thank you. Michael? The, the short answer is, well, there'll be belt tightening all around on, on the state level, on the federal level. We need to do everything humanly possible to make sure that there is no money taken out of education. And this speaks to me personally, because as I mentioned, if but for the fact that I was the recipient of such a, a phenomenal public school system, I never would have been able to climb out of homelessness. I never would have been able to, to go to college. Law school would have been a dream. So we need to do what, whatever it takes to, to, to defund certain programs while keeping the emphasis on education. Because later on, we're gonna be talking about criminal justice reform. We're gonna be talking about police abuse. All of these subjects, one way or another, are, are, are woven into education. And it is the most important building block for everything else that we need to do to, to make our country and make our, our state better. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie? Yes, thank you. Um, certainly COVID has exposed mass inequity uh, and we are at a deficit right now. Um, but the truth is even before COVID, we weren't adequately funding our school systems. You know, I support increased federal funding to schools. I think we need wraparound services in some of our um, 
in, in some of our poorer districts who don't have the same uh, opportunities as wealthier districts. We need to try to even out the inequities. And I think we I know we need to fully fund the IDEA. That has not been fully funded. Congress has not lived up to its promise to fund that program. And there are a lot of students suffering and we need to ensure that that happens. Uh, education is the building block for so many in this country. It is one of our most cherished services. It's a socialized service, but it's one of our most cherished, cherished services. And, uh, you know, I'm a proud product of the public school system. Uh, I also would not be sitting here talking to you today if I didn't have so many wonderful teachers. And we need to better assist this, not only our teachers, but this is truly the bridge to a better future for all of our children. So we need to make sure that we're adequately investing in it. Okay, thank you. Um, we now have several questions on health care, um, but as I was reviewing them, there are actually five questions, but I'm going to reduce them to two. Uh, and Stephanie, if it's okay with you, I'd like to do two minutes for each answer rather than 90 seconds so that we can get a little more meat in the discussion. Again, these are uh, about health care. The first one, um, is the pandemic has killed African Americans and Latinos at disproportionately high rates. A large I'm sorry, a large percentage of whom make up the ranks of our essential workers. These deaths are due in large part to health inequities in our society. How can we finally ensure access to affordable health care for all Americans? And um, could you specifically talk about minority communities and then expand that into your position and your proposals on expanding health care overall? So this one would start with Michael. And this is two minutes now if you need it. Sure. Well, health care is a human right. And at, at the beginning of this campaign, the beginning of this journey, I was, I was enthusiastically in favor of, of Medicare for all. And then I started visiting union halls and speaking with union members. I spent a lot of time with the United Federation of Teachers. And they said, Michael, we're, we're with you conceptually. But so many of our members have sacrificed so much to get top tier health care. We're desperately afraid that if Medicare for all becomes law, that the, the health care that we've sacrificed so hard to achieve is going to fall to pieces. So I'm I'm in favor of moving forward towards Medicare for all, but I can't say that I'm on board 100% until I can be confident that we won't be harming unions along the way. That being said, there's no question that our healthcare system needs to be more proactive rather than reactive. When people go into an emergency room or call an ambulance because they're having a stroke, there's an obligation to respond. But when it comes to the basic wellness and, and being healthy and, and the, the, the fundamental building box of, of of health and of achieving good health from the beginning were woefully inadequate. And not surprisingly, these are problems that are particularly tough in communities that are economically and socially disadvantaged. So I'm going to move forward and really focus on those communities move as when I become a member of Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie? Thank you. Um, so I'll start specifically with minority communities that we know in this country have been oppressed for uh, really since the inception of our country, and we see many inequities there. Um, you know, not just with healthcare, but uh, with housing, with uh, environmental justice, with uh, jobs, etc. Um, so Michael just confirmed for me. I wasn't sure until this evening. I am the only candidate in this race that is in favor of universal health care, and I'd love to tell you why. I spent my career as an allied health professional. I worked with families, with patients, and then later organizations on health improvement programs. I sat with CEOs and presidents and benefits directors as they were ripping their hair out, figuratively of course, stressing over how they were going to pay for healthcare. We know that healthcare is the second biggest cost driver for organizations, the second biggest cost driver. And every year, employer-based healthcare goes up nine to 11, excuse me, three to 11%. That is medical trend. So every year the costs go up. It's an unsustainable model and businesses cannot continue to afford to pay these increases. So what do they do? They cut your care. And we also have to recognize for a moment that the insurance industry is a business model predicated on denying people care. 
So if we truly believe that healthcare is a right, as I do, and not a privilege, then universal healthcare is the only way to go. I too have spoken with many union members, and I, I have heard uh, some similar um, you know, uh, concerns as Michael just mentioned, but I've also heard union members say, yes, you know, this is the way forward. There are ways to make them whole, to try to recoup some of what they lost, but the reality is for unions specifically, they will never get gains in get gains in their um their wages unless we can create an even playing field with uh healthcare, right otherwise that will always be the barrier to increased wages um so right now i believe that it is the only way forward studies have shown that it will save 450 billion dollars annually and 68,000 lives more importantly each and every year. I don't want to live in, a, in an America where senior citizens are rationing, rationing their insulin. I don't want to live in an America where young people are starting GoFundMes because they can't pay for their medical bills. Right now, medical debt is the number one driver for bankruptcies. If we truly care about healthcare, then Medicare for all, universal healthcare is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? I think this question was about healthcare disparities and the racial inequities that exist in our society that have been highlighted uh, by the coronavirus uh, related to healthcare disparities. And uh, when I was county executive, we did a lot of work on this, and we found that people who have the exact same health insurance, an African American and uh, uh, Caucasian, had the exact same health insurance, had the exact same illness had the exact same income level, but the outcomes were always worse for the person of color, especially for the African-Americans. Why is that? There's a big problem in our society related to cultural competence, understanding where people are coming from, how they look at things, and also problems with how the medical professionals look at the person of color. So you need to have more African-American doctors, more African-American nurses, more African-American scientists, same with Latinos, and that requires investment in education and scholarships. I spoke to one of the biggest experts on this in the country at a Ways and Means hearing recently, and he wants scholarships to get more folks in. Because what happens when you go to medical school is you end up with this huge amount of debt, and especially if you're coming from a low-income family in the first place. And then, instead of going back to your community to serve the people that you grew up with, you go somewhere where you can make more money. And as a result, because uh, you want to pay off that, that, that student debt related to med school. So we, it's a very big issue cultural competency as a part of healthcare disparities. Access to healthcare is very, very important. We have some of the best healthcare access in the country in New York State, yet we still see this disproportionate impact on persons of color here in New York State. So it's not simply a question of access. In the United States of America, most people, 170 million, 180 million people get their health insurance from their private employer. About another 75, 80 million people get their insurance from Medicaid and Medicare. About 40 million people are in the individual marketplace, which is where the crazy thing with the rates going up and where uh, people pulling out of the marketplace. And another 30 million or so are uninsured completely. Uh, my time is up, but let me just say that this is a very important issue. Joe Biden has a proposal. I was one of the first people to endorse Joe Biden, and I will follow his plan to address health care in America. Okay, Melanie, you want to quickly? Yeah, I just wanted I wanted to jump in. Um, there is a bill right now in Congress, uh, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2020, that would address or start to address, um, you know, the rising death rate of Black women um, in terms of uh, pregnancy. So I think we absolutely need more. Uh, education around it, as the congressman said, but we need true investment in it. And I hope to see the congressman co-sponsor that bill. I'll look into it. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other health question relates to women's reproductive rights, and there are two parts of it. Um, this one is going to start, Melanie, with you. Um, I'll read them both, but we're putting them together into one. Uh, number one, the Hyde Amendment has for over uh, 40 years barred the use of Medicaid funds from being used by women in having abortions. Um, this has the effect of restricting a woman's constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy based on her ability to pay. Would you support repealing the Hyde Amendment? Hold that thought. And then what is your position on women's reproductive rights? And do you believe that birth control products should be covered by all health insurance plans for men as well as women? Okay. Um, Stephanie, we'll go 
loosely between 90 and a minute, we'll, uh, two minutes, we'll see how it goes, okay. <laughs> okay, um, so a couple of things. So I adamantly support repealing the Hyde Amendment. Um, it's something we're proud of in our campaign. We pushed Congressman Swazi to finally sign on to Barbara Lee's Each Woman Act bill to also repeal the Hyde Amendment. Up until this primary, uh, he has told constituents that he considered it settled law. So I'm very proud that we were able to push him on this particular issue. I think as a woman, it is really important that each of us um, have autonomy over our own bodies. Uh, and I, I speak, you know, coming from myself in that perspective. Also, reproductive rights. Do I believe that insurance should cover um, uh, birth control. I believe in Medicare for all, which would also cover all of it. Absolutely. But I, I do think that even health insurance, it's prohibitive for those of us who don't have health insurance. Right now, there are millions that are uninsured. The public option would leave it's estimated about 28 million people uninsured. So that doesn't help in those particular situations. So when we want to talk about disparities in minority communities and lack of access, I disagree with the Congressman. It is not just about access, right? Because not everybody can access uh, healthcare. Not everyone can access it. So we need to ensure uh, a universal healthcare system so that we can ensure that all people have access. So that healthcare truly is a human right, that everyone has access to make their own choices when it comes to reproductive care and reproductive health. Thank you. Tom? Uh, first of all, I have 100% rating from Planned Parenthood and 100% rating from NARAL. Uh, long before this campaign began, I voted on a bill against the Republicans' efforts to make the Hyde Amendment permanent. You said in your original question that this law has been in place for 40 years. That's why I've said in the past that it was settled law. But I did sign on to this bill, uh, and I do support the repeal of the Hyde Amendment. Uh, I'm not sure what was previously said about uh, that I think that access is the only issue. I certainly think access is a major issue, uh, the, probably one of the most important issues, but affordability is also an issue. Healthcare disparities is a major issue. Uh, uh, new technology is a major issue. Uh, changing the way that we deliver health care based more on prevention instead of based upon treating sickness. We need to promote health. Uh, we need to promote healthier lifestyles. There are so many different issues that go into the issue of health care, not just access. Access is very, very important, but there are so many other factors that are involved in the issue as well. Okay. Thank you. Michael? Okay. Uh, when it comes to uh, the women's right to choose, I am unabashedly, enthusiastically pro-choice. I'm, I'm the most pro-choice person around, and I have been since I was, I was a teenager. Um, there is a subject that I never imagined that I would be talking about today, and that relates to uh, whether or not insurance companies should, should pay for contraceptives. It's possible that I may have held on to my virginity longer than any of my friends, any of my high school friends, my college friends. I held on to it for a while. Do I think that that insurance companies should be paying for condoms? No. If guys are lucky enough to actually be having sex, which I wasn't for a long time, they should pay for their own condoms. Uh, Melanie, this is your last rebuttal. Yes, thank you. Um, so we were endorsed by the National Institute for Reproductive Health Action Fund in this primary. Um, I know a lot of the other uh, reproductive rights organizations have stayed out of this race so far. Um, I, I didn't hear the congressman answer the question as to whether or not he believes insurance companies should pay for contraception and birth control. I, I would like him to address that. Uh, and Michael, for your, you know, it's not just about condoms. It is also birth control for, for women that can uh, help, you know, plan for a healthy pregnancy. So I think that's an important element. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm going to answer that, but I don't want to use up my rebuttals uh, as, as part of this, though. So... Uh, I certainly do believe that insurance companies should pay for contraception. And uh, in fact, I think the most effective way to prevent abortions in the United States of America is to have more access to contraception in the country. In fact, when I was a county executive in Nassau County, I was the only county executive that ever in the history of the county funded contraception programs to try and uh, prevent unintended pregnancies in the first place. If people really are genuine, that they want to try and make abortion safe, legal, and more rare. The best way to do that is to prevent unintended pregnancies in the first place. And the way to do that is through education and through more contraception. Okay, thank you. And you still get one more, and we only have two more questions, so you'll be okay. Thank you. All right. Um, 
The next question uh, was just added because uh, the, the preparation had started a while ago, and that, of course, has to do with social justice for Black Lives in America. Um, this one will start with Tom, and uh, I'd like to give each of you up to two minutes on this. Okay, Stephanie? Um, what steps would you take to further social justice for Black Lives in America? Well, let me say very clearly that black lives do matter, but a slogan by itself is not going to solve the problem. We need to pass legislation. That's why today I'm the original co-sponsor of the Democrats' uh, legislation that we proposed today to address social justice related to law enforcement and criminal justice here in the United States of America, to make uh, chokeholds illegal, to create a national registry for police officers that have been found uh, to have misconduct where they've lost their jobs so they're not rehired in the, some other community uh, in the future, to have more training, uh, to make uh, grants from the federal government to local police departments contingent upon them having that type of training, to having more transparency and having more reporting, to stop the uh, use of uh, military equipment from the federal government being distributed to local governments, unless it's in the case of a place like New York City that has massive issues related to possible terrorist attacks. Uh, so uh, you can't just talk about it. You have to actually pass legislation to get it done. You have to work over on it. It's not as simple as just making a speech and everybody applauds and the band starts to play. Dun, 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 you march out and it's done. It takes years and years and years of effort. And the coronavirus showed us about the healthcare disparities. The murder of George Floyd highlighted what we all know uh, has been misconduct by some police officers. Most police officers do a good job and are, do not engage in misconduct. Nobody should be against the police. They should be against police misconduct. But there's also inequities that exist in income, in housing, uh, in health care, uh, and in so many different areas. And I'm hoping that with the energy that's been displayed uh, recently, especially by young people across a diverse spectrum of races and income levels and geographies in this country, we can finally get the momentum to address what is a stain on the history of this country, uh, which is the racism, the systemic racism that has existed for so long. And now with the energy, hopefully we can get the legislation passed to actually do something about it. Okay, thank you. Michael? I've dedicated most of my career to improving the criminal justice system. I'm a huge fan of police accountability and transparency, and, and there should also be every district attorney's office in the country and every federal prosecutor's office should have a committed, dedicated, standalone office to prevent wrongful convictions. Just the other day, I received a phone call from a colleague of mine. He said, I know you're busy with the campaign. Are, are you taking any new cases? And I said, no, 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 absolutely not. He said, but you might want to take this one. It's a young woman. She's a reporter from Canada, and she's been arrested, wrongfully arrested in Manhattan, and she's in custody. Can, can you handle it? And I said, can I handle it? Of course I can handle it. it I, I can't say no to something like that. So I, I put my campaign on hold for two days. I schlepped into Manhattan, and I worked doggedly to get this young woman released from, from jail. And, and the, the, stories that she, the, the, the stories that she told me when she came out were, were heartbreaking, from everything from women who didn't have sanitary napkins in, in jail to the to how, how long some people were being held. But one of the things that she did, she showed me the video, she's a reporter. She showed me the video that, that was taken when she was arrested. And I saw police officers not only breaking the law, but standing around. There should be accountability, not just for officers who break the law, but the stand arounders. Right now in New York State, you can be prosecuted for breaking the law. But if you're a police officer and you do nothing and you just stand around, there's no accountability whatsoever. So I want these officers held accountable. I want there to be transparency. In New York State, we have a crazy law, but the 50A law that actually shields police officers' records. As an attorney, I, I filed FOIL applications to get police officers' records, and I can't get them because they're shielded from this crazy law. We need to do away with it. And while people often talk about bail reform, nobody's talking about the New York State 3030 regulation about speedy trial. Much like municipal uh, programs, it's not sexy, but it's important. So I, when I'm a member of Congress, I will address all of these issues and I'll do it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Okay, Melanie? Uh, am, I, am I still muted? I'm unmuted. No, you're okay now. Sorry. Uh, so, you know, this, 
criminal justice reform, these conversations, they didn't just start with George Floyd. Hopefully he is the person that will start to implement the change. Um, I'd like to thank the congressman for signing on to the legislation. I haven't read it yet. Um, I'm excited to read it. I, I know that you haven't typically supported criminal justice reform, so I'm going to thank you for supporting that. Um, as we know, there have been mass peaceful protests in the streets for over two weeks now, and the overwhelming majority of our community is peacefully protesting and marching in solidarity to proclaim that Black Lives Matter, that we're standing in solidarity. Uh, and as the congressman said, this is not an anti-police movement. It's an anti-police brutality movement. It's not a partisan issue either. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, independents, unaffiliated voters have all shown up to demand change and transparency and accountability. Uh, I believe that implementing legislation and evidence-based policies to reduce police use of force have been shown to reduce um, violence against Black people by 72%. Uh, you know, specifically procedures like banning chokeholds, like, uh, excuse me, like Congressman Swazi said earlier, uh, re requiring de-escalation, a duty to intervene, demilitarizing the police. So I'm happy to see that there's legislation moving on that. I think we also need to support ending the defense of qualified immunity. We need to end the federal government 1033 program uh, if we really want to see actual change because there's a difference between uh, changing behavior and changing outcomes and we need to look at the science and create an evidence-based approach that truly does change outcomes and maybe that does mean reimagining what our police force looks like we know that a violent crimes are only about 5% of crimes committed. So maybe we don't need a completely staffed, militarized police, but maybe we need more social workers. Maybe we need more EMTs in the example of if there's a car accident. Maybe we don't need a police with all kind, a policeman with all kind, or a policewoman with all kinds of weapons going to the scene. Uh, maybe it's better suited. So maybe this is an opportunity for us to reimagine what our police force looks like and create safer communities and, uh, you know, a, a safer environment for the police as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one short last question and then we'll go to the closing statements. Um, while I'm asking this, I need Diane or Stephanie to clarify the order of the closing statements, but let me ask this question already. Um, the League's final question was, how do you propose to approach working across party lines to achieve your policy goals? Uh, I was just reading today again all the different scenarios in November. Republicans hold the White House, but Democrats get the Senate, keep the House, you know, and all these chess pieces moving around. It's likely that you will not have all three, the House, the Senate, and the uh, presidency, exactly aligned. There will always be some working together. So could each of you just speak very briefly about how you think the best way to approach that is? And uh, Michael, you would be first on this. Sure. I mentioned earlier that I'm blessed to be running, but I, I'm, I'm blessed for yet another reason. Um, on the morning of September 11th, like, like firefighters across the city and across the region, I rushed down to the World Trade Center. And I, I waved down a, a passing rig and I arrived while both towers were still standing. And I had a, a very close call when both towers came down. I mean, very, very close call, but thankfully I, I wasn't physically injured. I suffered from PTSD, very severe, very severe PTSD for a long, long time. But one of the unusual, maybe the only positive thing that came from, from that horrible experience was all sorts of unexpected friendships. And because of that, I have truly unexpected friendships with, with a whole bevy of GOP elected officials that I normally would never stop and, uh, and, and, and chat with. Everybody from, from Congressman King to, uh, to Rudy Giuliani. Whenever I pass, cross paths with Mayor Giuliani, he comes over and gives me a hug and he asks how I'm doing. So, and one of the things that I'll do, because I'm lucky enough to have those, those bipartisan connections, I'll submit, I'll, I'll, I will promote a bill to make sure that all of the first responders from this crisis, all the, all the people who are at the front lines of the COVID crisis, whether they're nurses or EMTs or, or paramedics, have access to all of the care that they need for PTSD. My fire department paid for six sessions with a therapist after 9-11. I needed, six sessions weren't gonna help me. I needed 60 sessions. I needed maybe 600 sessions. My PTSD didn't go away for years. And ultimately, I paid out of pocket more than $30,000. I don't even get a tax benefit from that. So 
if I'm elected to Congress, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to use my bipartisan connections, and I'm going to promote a bill to make sure that our rescue workers and people on the front lines aren't out of pocket and they're not crushed financially because they're doing the right thing. Thank you. Melanie? Yes, thank you. Um, so how do we work, how do, uh, just so I remember the question, how do we work across party lines to achieve policy goals? Was that the question? That was the question. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So I think it starts by electing representatives who refuse corporate money and refuse super PAC money, because then we know that we have, we're working with a clean slate. We know that that representative is only beholden to constituents and not their corporate donors. I've spent my career winning stakeholder buy-in with some of the most notoriously difficult folks to get to come to, to, get to, come to the table. Um, and, and I think what, where it starts is identifying a goal and making sure we're on the same page. Too often in politics, we think we're having the same conversation, but we're not having the same conversation. Democrats are saying, stop locking kids in cages, and Republicans are saying, stop stealing our jobs, and we're not even having the same conversation. So we have to identify the goal, what we're trying to do, then we build an evidence-based approach around it. Um, when we have people coming together in good faith, that's when we work together. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen that in a Trump administration. We haven't seen that with a rogue GOP. Um, I, that's one of the reasons I'm running for Congress, because I think we need representatives who are legislating for people, and I'm excited to do that. Thank you. Tom? Let me first say that uh, my goal is to have Joe Biden in the White House, to have Chuck Schumer as the majority leader of the Senate, and to keep Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, but in the beginning of this debate, I talked about acta non verba, uh, deeds, not words. And uh, I can do it because I've done it. I've d worked very hard in my career in Congress and before Congress as Mayor Glenn Cove and as County Executive to work across party lines to try and get things done for the people that I serve. I'm a proud Democrat. I'll always be a Democrat. But I know that in order to get things done, to get things done that are effective and long lasting, you have to work with people that don't necessarily agree with you. And I've done that throughout my career. That's why I'm the vice chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, 25 Democrats and 25 Republicans who work together to try and find common ground. We just issued, we got 25 Republicans to sign off on a statement today about the need to address racial disparities in the United States of America. That in itself is a major accomplishment, but there's a long list of accomplishments of working across party lines to get things done. The money that I delivered for the Beth Page Plumes because I worked with Peter King. You know, I took lots of Democrats. They don't like Peter King. They don't like his, his positions. I'm glad Michael likes him. That's good. But you know what they do like? They like working together to get things done to solve problems for the people that we face. Peter King was the only Republican that voted on the HEROES Act along with all the Democrats. Uh, Peter King voted with me along with about six or seven other Republicans uh, to restore the SALT deduction. Uh, so I've made that a, a very, very big, very big part of my effort in the United States Congress. It's not always easy to do. Some people beat you up for even talking to the other side. Uh, but the reality is in order to get things done, to get things done for the people that I serve, the people that I represent, to get things done for the, for the state of New York, I'm willing to work across party lines to get those things done. And I've done it throughout my career and certainly in the time that I've been in the United States Congress. So I'm gonna do everything I can. Like I said, I was the first Democrat in Congress to endorse Joe Biden for the United States presidency. He endorsed at seven in the morning, I endorsed him at 7.30. Uh, and I'm gonna do everything to make him the president of the United States and defeat Donald Trump. And I'm gonna do everything I can to help the senators and to maintain the majority in the Congress as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephanie or Diane, uh, what's our order of closing statements? I'm not getting an answer. You have to unmute. Okay. Oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. So, yeah. I, I don't know. I think we've, we've got three candidates, so somebody's always in the middle. So um, I think in the past, often we the person who started goes last uh, with, you know, the reverse okay. order. But Okay. All right. Okay. So that would mean Melanie started, so Melanie would wrap, so Michael, you would start. Michael would go so, first. Yeah. And yeah. again, we have one minute for the close. This is for you to impress those thousands of people who are going to go on YouTube tomorrow to watch this debate. So be succinct, make your points, make your case. And again, I'll already say we really appreciate your taking the time to engage with us this evening. Um, you get probably more covered than you do when you're in person, but I still feel that energy in the room and there's a lot of people. 
But again, thank you. Good luck to all of you. And Michael, your closing statement. Thank you. I not only want to thank the, uh, the men and women of the League of Women Voters for putting together this phenomenal event under a very trying circumstance. I also want to thank the students at Great Neck North High School and the Model Congress and the, the guide folks who helped me prepare. And um, if I'm elected, God willing, if I'm elected to Congress, I'll become a congressman that represents all New Yorkers, not just the wealthy and privileged. And anybody who, who questions where, Tom, where Congressman Swazi is coming from or what his priorities are, they don't need to look any further than his offices. Congressman Swazi has two offices. One is in Huntington and the other is in Queens. The office in Huntington is beautiful. I mean, beautiful. It, it was actually an incredible um, state house or an, an incredible um, home in the American Revolution. And it's been refurbished and turned into mo modern offices. Everything is, about it is beautiful. Um, the office in Queens, however, is falling apart. It's, it's a shtetl. It's on the, the, the second floor <laughs> building on Northern Boulevard across from McDonald's. Um, the, the Queen's office, it's closed two or three days a week, opposed to the Long Island office. And it's not even, it's not even accessible to the disabled. If you're a person in a wheelchair and you want to visit Congressman Swazi in the Queen's office, you're not doing it. So I'll, I'll represent all, you know, all New Yorkers. And I might even ask Congressman Swazi if, if you're, if, how do you think it makes people in wheelchairs feel when they're at your office in Queens and they can't even all go right. upstairs to me? Thank you, Michael. Okay. Melanie, closing statement? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Tom, we're doing this this way right now. My apologies. Tom, your closing statement? Okay, um, no, Tom, we can't hear you. He's muted, he's kind of unmute. Okay, unmute. Okay. I don't know how I got muted. Yeah. Okay. Start. Start the uh, sixty seconds now, please. Some quotes uh, for my closing. Uh, first is from the Herald's April twenty-first. Swazi working around the clock amid the crisis. Uh, the other from New York One, April twentieth. Democratic Congressman Tom Swazi fighting for New York and Washington. From the Queens Courier, April twenty-first. As his constituents in Queens continue to reel from life at the epicenter of COVID nineteen pandemic, Congressman Tom Swazi continues to fight for the health and economic well-being of all New Yorkers. And from the island now on May 26th, U.S. Rep. Tom Swazi's biggest priority is bringing money back to New York. And finally, from, from May 27th, from the island now, while U.S. Rep. Tom Swazi has spent the past three months aiding in coronavirus relief for New York's third congressional district, two of his challenges for the Democratic congressional nomination have been caught up in litigation and controversial comments. The bottom line is acting on verba. I've been working throughout my entire career and certainly my time in Congress to serve the people that I represent to the best of my ability. And I'm gonna to continue to do so if I'm fortunate enough to receive your vote in the June 23rd primary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Melanie? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again for hosting this wonderful forum tonight. Um, look, the reality is if I believe the Congressman was working for people, I wouldn't be running for Congress. I'd probably be handing out palm cards for our current representative. That's what I'd probably be doing, but I'm not because he's not working for people. And the reality is, is you can't have it both ways. You can't talk about Mitch McConnell being terrible and then go on vacation with Mike Pence at a lobbyist funded spa weekend, Tom. You can't blame Mitch McConnell for not passing bills and then caucus with the Republicans who have shown us that they have no interest in fighting for democratic values. I'm running because I believe we deserve better. We deserve to elect a, a democratic representative who's fighting for democratic values. And that is what I intend to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And again, uh, lady and gentlemen, thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, good luck to all of you. Uh, early voting starts on Saturday. The absentee ballots are being received by people already. And uh, I'll be reporting to one of the uh, election reporters from the Suffolk Board of Elections, but not in your district. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So good luck and okay. thank you again. Thank, thank you, you to the Huntington League of Women Voters and of yes. course to Five Towns College for helping with the technology yes. on this. And thank you, Lisa. And thanks to all the candidates for their willingness to serve. It, it isn't easy ever and it's particularly difficult now. So I wish you all the best. Thanks, Diane. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Stephanie. <laughs>
Rand Stephanie answer first. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.